Welcome to the Homegrown Hunter TV. I'm your host, Steve Elmy. On today's show, we're gonna take you throughout the summer months and show you how you can take a spot like this and make it very productive doing food plotting. Stay tuned. Welcome to another great season of the Homegrown Hunter. Good girl. Homegrown Hunter TV is brought to you by Rackstacker, Canada's leader in big game attractants. Campbellford Chrysler, a small town dealer with a huge inventory. Huckabones Equipment, Ottawa Valley's Kubota dealer. Bishop Lake Outdoors, First Place Trailers, Altan Outdoor Solutions. Badlands Packs and Apparel, the original portable winch, nature of design signs and graphics, and these other fine sponsors. On a lot of farms, you'll see very low productive areas such as this behind me. This is a small pocket that's overgrown with a bunch of prickly ash. Now Brian and I today are going to be cutting that prickly ash down flush to the ground in order for us to plant a product called walk and toss. It's a very simple product, it's high rich in clovers, it's going to draw deer in throughout the summer months. And in order for you to track us and follow, I've actually put some flagging tape in the middle of the spot and we're not going to cut that one down because I'm going to explain to you a little later. So let's get at it. Pre-planning food plots is a very important thing to do. Our plan the fall before was to mark this spot out and get at it in the springtime after the snow was gone. This is the early part of April around Easter weekend and the goal here is to clear the area so that we can allow as much sunlight to the forest floor prior to planting the seed. It does take some time and some sweat equity, but if you do put your time into it, I assure you, you will have five to six years of pleasant hunting and lots of deer and game activity in the area. As we go through the show today, we're gonna to show you lots of details on how easy it is, with a little bit of sweat equity, you can get the job done in a fair amount of time. We're not arguing here. We're simply just trying to decide on where to put all this extra material. There is a reason behind us piling this stuff up and Ashlyn's gonna explain later. But for now, we're just going to come up with a bit of a game plan for the day. This week's tech tip is brought to you by Huckabones Equipment, Ottawa Valley's Kubota dealer. Food plotting can be a lot of fun. Let me show you some of the tools that Dad has used over the years. Now this is a great tool to use in the field. This is just a simple pair of loppers. This is made by a company called Fiskers. If you're looking to get yourself some, I would recommend looking into a high quality brand like Fiskers. Great to use in the field, however, they can be cumbersome. Now this is a Husqvarna 235. Dad loves it for trimming shooting lanes, clearing small brush, trimming apple trees. Now it has a smaller bar on it and it's super easy to handle. However, if you're looking for a newer model, this is the Husqvarna 440. It's got a longer bar, it's lightweight, so it reduces fatigue in the field. It has an effortless start using spring assist and quick spark injection. And it also is extremely fuel efficient. This is the Husqvarna 545 FX brush clearing saw. This is the ideal piece of equipment for using in the field. Yeah, we use this on the day of the food plot. However, there are other people in the area and it became a safety concern. 
When operating a brush clearing saw, you want to make sure that there's no one in the area. You're using side to side motion as well as the spinning blade. That's why it's also important to make sure that you're wearing the proper protective equipment. Swing by our local Husqvarna dealer to see what they have available, or check out your local rental center to see if they have what you're looking for for the weekend. Back to the show. Was that good? <laughs> Some folks may choose to burn the brush that they are cutting out of the way. However, we've chosen to pile it up next to the plot. These brush piles will act as great cover for lower game animals like rabbits, turkey, and grouse. Having these piles are important as it will provide good nesting cover away from predators, and over time you will see an increase in the animals that use them. Okay, so we're making some progress. We got the west side of the food plot done. And when you're planting food plots, you want to make sure you plant east to west so that as the sun comes up, it gets as much sunlight as it possibly can before it sets. There's a couple of bigger trees over top of the quad. You can see them there. I'm going to probably cut them down because I want to make sure that they've got lots of sunlight. But we're making some progress. Stay tuned. We're ready for this break. We'll get back and we'll show you how we're going to get it planted. Welcome back to The Homegrown Hunter. I'm Ashley Melby. Dad, Brian, and my brother Logan have been working on a food plot project at the Rackstack firm. Clearing the brush out of the way to plant a product called Walk and Toss. If you are new to food plotting, Walk and Toss would be an ideal product to get you started. You can plant small locations with great success and minimum work or equipment needed. Walk and Toss food plots were designed with small properties in mind. In this case, not everyone has use of a tractor and can at least feel comfortable with getting a small plot in the ground without feeling too frustrated with the process. If you're looking for a place to put a plot on your hunting property, don't underestimate the potential of where you can plant. What you'll be looking for is a spot that can allow for at least four hours of sunlight. Dad will later explain what to look for to achieve this. You can also plan on clearing trees from a hardwood bush to open up for sunlight to the forest floor. As long as there is sunlight and good moisture in the ground, you will be successful. You can be rest assured that Rack Stacker is here to help. Simply reach out to our 1-800 line if you have any questions at all. One of our elite staff will be glad to help you with any questions that you may have. In some cases, we may choose to get a small plot started and planted in one year. The following spring, we would normally expand the plot by 10 feet wider to improve the location. That way, you don't have to feel like it's a lot of work the first year. Food plots could be as big or as small as you want them to be. The biggest key is to ensure they get as much sunlight as they possibly can for maximum production. An easy way of telling if the spot is big enough, stand facing north, and for every 10 feet of ground space, will be approximately one hour's worth of sunlight. Therefore, be sure to plant a minimum of 40 foot east to west. Smaller secluded locations will keep the deer tight to cover, making them want to come out during daylight hours. The best time of year to be planting walk and toss is the spring of the year. As soon as the frost starts coming out of the ground, it's time to get ready. Fish bump. If you have access to a tractor, it's much easier job to get this done. You can limb off the branches and just push them up into a pile. This certainly speeds the process up. However, there will be a few more steps that need to get done prior to seeding. We're going to explain all the details of what needs to get done prior to getting the seed to the ground. Still lots of frost in the ground, eh? If you got access to some equipment, you can do it a lot quicker. 
Now don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. We're gonna show some more details of what has to get done before seeding. Welcome back to the Homegrown Hunter. I've got an extra couple hands in here helping us get the debris off the food plot prior to seeding. And we're now gonna have Tyrell use a heavy drag to disturb the soil. This will ensure that you get good seed to soil contact when you start spreading the seed. All right, so it's just time to seed now. I'm gonna be using a basic broadcast spreader you can pick up at your local hardware store. This one here I've actually got set to setting three. I'm gonna overseed this plot a little bit because I'm expecting a lot of browse pressure down in this little hidey hole that's in behind my property. We're gonna be using a product called Walk and Toss by Rack Stacker. Walk and Toss is fantastic for these little pockets. It's a little bit of disturbance on the ground and you could broadcast it down and get good germination and seed to soil contact. And I'm gonna do what's called grid patterning. So we're gonna run north to south on one pass and then I'm gonna go east to west on the other pass overseeing it just slightly because I know that there's going to be a lot of browse pressure down in this area. Doing a grid pattern on the plot when broadcasting your seed will ensure that you get good, even coverage. You'll see that Dad goes around the whole plot in one direction, and then crosses back the opposite direction on his second pass. Now, once you spread your seed down, it's really, really important. Like it's almost insurance for your food plot to ensure that you're getting good seed to soil contact. So we're gonna go get the roller. We're gonna roll this down and pack it as tight as we possibly can. It'll press all the air pockets out of the soil, make sure that the roots get into the soil right away. The roller that we're using today is called a cultipacker. It's kind of a high-end roller. However, you can use a lawn roller or even the tires of a four-wheeler. You don't have to worry about damaging the seed. The goal here is to press the seed into the soil. Packing will help keep the seed in place for near instant germination or in case there's a heavy rain. Now the cool thing is with this, these little spots, they're fantastic to hunt. It might be quiet, you're not going to get 20 deer feeding in here, but that once in a lifetime buck is going to pop into this spot. Now it's early April, we're going to come back here in a couple months, we'll take a look at it and show you the results that we get. Voila! After a few months of heat and rain, the plot has taken right off. It's important to understand that clover needs a minimum of 90 days to grow a strong root system and will not grow as fast as you're expecting. Being the first year of this plot, it will take some time to establish, and when it takes hold, boy oh boy is she evergreen. Here are another few smaller plots done with the six P's of plotting. So now that we've got this all set up and it's been almost eight months now, you can see there's lots of food still available here. I'm just gonna dig this up. You'll see there's lots of clover still available. You'll find that the deer are gonna be pawing at this food plot for quite some time through the winter time until all this is gone. And now that it's all knocked down to the ground, this used to be about eight to 10 inches tall and I'll show you how to maintain this throughout the year as well. But this is a very important food source to raise the carrying capacity of your property and hold those deer in the area. The only other thing I would suggest is probably getting yourself a feeder if you want to start feeding. This is a Banks 150 available at rackstacker.ca. I built my own portable platform and I put a sheath of heat duct on there to keep the critters from climbing up. So it'll actually pay for itself the first year if you're interested in doing a you know, feed source that way with your food plot. Now while I got you, come on over here. I'm going to show you one more thing. I left that one branch. You can see it's almost 10 feet high. This whole thing was eight to 10 feet tall. And what was happening in here is that because the leaves on that branch or that prickly ash or sumac or whatever the area you're planting, it's actually choking out the sunlight to the bottom. That's what makes it so easy to do because you can cut this to the ground, rake all the debris out of the way and get yourself a productive food plot. The only other thing you can do is this is west facing. You'll see these bigger trees. Because they're 60 to 70 feet high, you produce a bit of money by selling it as firewood, use it for yourself, but cutting it east to west, you're going to produce more sunlight to the forest floor, allowing more productive food plots in the future. After getting your food plot established, it's important to maintain the plot over the years so that you get longevity out of it. 
Now, when your clovers start to grow up throughout the summer months, it does take a bit of time the first year because it has to establish a strong root system. But once you get into the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth year of walk and toss plots, you need to cut it down so that you're getting lush growth all the time and keeping those weeds at bay. When your clovers get to eight to 10 inches tall, you're gonna start seeing some weed seed come up in that clover. It's important to cut that off so that your clovers end up choking out the weeds that are coming in. I like to use this battery powered Husqvarna weed eater. It's got a removable chargeable battery on it. It's super light to take into the bush. It is fully adjustable. So you can pack it into tight spots very easily. And of course, it is also quiet when you're operating it because you don't want to be spooking any game animals. Now when you do that, it typically happens anywhere between four and six weeks throughout the summer months. And the last time you want to do that is the September long weekend because it's going to give four to six weeks prior to your bow season starting in October. So keep that in mind. Make sure you maintain your food plot. And the only other thing you can do is throw a bit of fertilizer. Go to rackstacker.ca for fertilizer recommendations and the size of it. Now, right now, this is a smaller food plot. I'm going to take you to a larger food plot where I introduce a young lad and his dad to their first doe hunt on a larger food plot location. Stick around, we'll be right back. The day before Caleb was coming to hunt, Dad seen a lot of deer activity over a field edge food plot. At the Rackstacker farm, these yearling bucks are protected. We do not shoot them. Studies have shown that young bucks like these do the majority of the breeding and as you can tell, are very comfortable being in the field. These make for great decoys to bring the big boys out. How far is that seed? Is that a honey yard? Honey deer is anything within the berm, and then once you're farther out, you're 140. Oh. So I would wait until they get stepped inside the berm, and then they're good to go. That woman, you filming? Are you filming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see her. Right by the blind, up on the berm. Yeah, yeah. See her. You see the white on her nose. I think I see her. Caleb has a doe tag in his pocket, and our goal was to have him harvest a doe to balance the buck to doe ratio. On the second day of the hunt, a snowstorm was rolling through and was making it tough to get focused on this doe before it was too dark. Can you hit her in the front shoulder? Can you hit her in the front shoulder? Yeah. Wait, 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 right there, kill her. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the last night, the last few minutes. That was a good mature doe. She was on to us too. Hey, did you see that? Yeah, she put her head up and she about to jog away. I was like, yeah, I gotta take my shot. And I so did you hit her right in the front shoulder? Yeah. On the right left side? Yeah. Awesome. She didn't go very far. And her two fawns followed her in. Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. I see the flags going. That other gunshot was next door. Yeah, yeah. Ashwin was texting me asking if uh, if it was us. So yeah. This one was us. Yeah. <laughs> There's blood right there. She went left. There's blood. She got Yeah, but she went left. Take your time. Yep, just take your time. Oh, there's blood right here. Blood right there. Right here. Blood there. Blood there. Blood all over that tree. Yep. Right here. Right here. Man, keep your light down. Keep your light down. 
of that tree. Right, right where your foot is. Yep. It's smeared all over that tree. Well, there's lots here. Oh, there she, there she is. is. She's right there. She's pretty close. There's the bike. <laughs> there you go, brother. Yeah. Right. That's it. We'll pull her head up. And... Take my glasses. Right. We're not 30 yards from the quad. No. Right there. She didn't come in the woods. She must have hit her good. We were a little nervous there with the video at first, but. It's right here. You can the see. Hole right there. Oh, yeah. well, what do you think, bud? <laughs> How do you like the rack stacker farm in food plots? Sick. <laughs> Is that the way to hunt? Over yeah. food plots? Ooh. <laughs> How many uh, how many food plots are we starting next year? Oh, another couple. <laughs> For sure. So what's the uh, ideal buck to doe ratio? Well, when it comes to managing your herd, like for us, we've got lots of does and fawns. And when you're trying to get more mature deer on their feet and see them more during daylight, you have to create like a territorial fight between bucks. And if you've got too many girlfriends and too little of bucks, you, you have to balance that buck to doe ratio and the best part is having it at two to one. We have a lot of girlfriends so we try to manage our does as much as we handle our bucks and by handling the, the doe population and balancing that buck to doe ratio allows us to get more response from, from calling. For past episodes be sure to check out hghtv.ca. Until next time!